Hi, I'm Michael. This is Lessons from the Screenplay. Pure, thoughtful science fiction is never just about aliens or other worlds or exciting visions of the future. At its core, hard sci-fi is about humanity, our hopes and fears, principles, and behaviors. The short story by Ted Chang, Story of Your Life, is a great example of exactly this kind of science fiction. But in order to bring its essence into the cinematic realm, screenwriter Eric Heiserer had to make several changes to the original story. And even then, director Denis Villeneuve and editor Joe Walker had to further tweak the narrative to bring it to life. So today, I want to look at the changes made during the adaptation of the short story, to examine how experimentation in the editing process inspired some creative ways to solve common problems and see how a story about characters trying to understand an alien species was designed to let us further understand ourselves. Let's take a look at Arrival. Story of Your Life by Ted Chang was published in November of 1998. It's a moving mixture of discussions about science and determinism and the love and loss of a child but there were three key elements that needed to be altered for the story to work as a screenplay. The first I want to talk about is perspective. The short story is narrated by Louise on the night her child is conceived. She alternates between memories of her past with the aliens and memories of her future with her daughter. In order to create a more conventional character arc for the protagonist, screenwriter Eric Heiserer decided to reframe the story. Rather than being told by a Louise who can already look both backward and forward at her life, Arrival follows Louise as she discovers the gift of the alien language. Instead of having the flash forwards be constant throughout the story, they are introduced at the beginning and then sprinkled throughout the rest of the film as Louise learns more of the alien language. Doing this brings the audience further into Louise's perspective. When she begins seeing flashes of her and her daughter, we perceive them as memories just as she does. And it's not until she learns that these are visions of the future that we understand this as well. Choosing this perspective for the film ensures a steady flow of reveals for both Louise and the audience. The second alteration made to the short story has to do with conflict and tension. In the short story, the aliens never actually land on Earth. Instead, they send down 112 looking glasses which acted as two-way communication devices, presumably with the ships in orbit. This would not make for very compelling scenes. As Eric Heiser said, I can't have him spend a year in a room Skyping with some, some aliens. This is, not a, this is not a film. And the first major change that I pitched to him and, and that we brought to it was they show up at our door. I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out to the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith. It's a fantastic podcast where he interviews screenwriters, and this audio is from one of his interviews. The link is in the description below, you should definitely check it out. Anyway, changing the short story so that the aliens actually come down to the planet, and the characters can interact with them face to face, had a huge impact on the inherent tension of the story. Suddenly, there's an immediate threat. Why are they here? Are they dangerous? Despite the interactions with the aliens ultimately being safe, their mere presence motivates most of the conflict in the film. There is public hysteria. A few soldiers attempt to destroy the ship, and world leaders treat the arrival as an act of aggression. Having the aliens land on Earth created the tension and conflict necessary to sustain a feature film. The last alteration I want to discuss involves the manner in which Hannah, Louise's daughter, dies. In the short story, Hannah dies at the age of 25 in a rock climbing accident. But in the screenplay, Hannah dies from an incurable disease, and at a much younger age, during her adolescence. So why make these changes? The first reason has to do with film being a visual medium. Part of it was we needed to make sure the child didn't get old enough that we'd have to age up the actress playing Louise. Because that gave away, that gave away everything. If it was obvious from the beginning that the flashbacks were actually flash-forwards, then there would be no reveal at the end of the film. The second reason has to do with making sure the protagonist's choices matter. In the short story, Louise's character arc is to realize that the universe is deterministic, and she must learn to embrace the inevitable. And I was a bit rebellious about that. I'm like, Ted, I don't like that. 
And I said, I think it's more profound for me if she has a choice, if she has free will and can change her future, and yet she chooses to have Hannah. Louise has to be able to change the future in order for her to choose to have Hannah. And for this choice to have meaning, Hannah can't die from something preventable, like a rock climbing accident, because Louise would just stop her from rock climbing. So by changing the story so that Hannah dies from a disease, Louise's character is able to choose the love of her child knowing full well the loss that will come as a result of it. All of these alterations made during the adaptation process highlight the importance of screenwriting basics. Being engaged in the protagonist's journey of discovery, the need for immediate conflict and tension, and emotional impact through choice. But in the case of Arrival, the writing process didn't stop with the screenplay. There are many key differences between the script and the final film. As Eric Heiserer says, You know, the third version of a movie is always found in editing. The editing process for Arrival lasted for six months, and reading the screenplay, it's obvious that many scenes are missing or were condensed or were tweaked to create the final film. For example, halfway through the film, there's a three minute montage that is strictly focused on telling the audience information about the aliens. Here are some of the many things we don't know about heptopods. In the screenplay, however, all this information is spread out across several scenes and various story threads. There's a scene in which they learn how the heptopods think and write. This scene was removed from the film, and the information added as voiceover in the montage. Their written language has no forward or backward direction. Linguists call this nonlinear orthography. In the script, Louise uses an analogy to explain this to Colonel Weber. But in the film, this becomes another voiceover line. Imagine you wanted to write a sentence using two hands starting from either side. You would have to know each word you wanted to use, as well as how much space that it would occupy. And a scene was removed where Ian draws a picture of the aliens and names them. Again, this dialogue was transferred to the montage narration. Greek, hepta seven, pod foot, seven feet, heptapod. This shows that sometimes it's better to get all the exposition out at once if it's otherwise holding back your story. Another example of creative editing falls into the category of a happy accident. In the screenplay, there is a story thread that involves Colonel Weber worrying about Louise's mental state. It gets to the point where he temporarily takes her off the project and assigns Ian to take over. This sequence was removed from the final film, again for pacing reasons. But as the editor explains, We took it out and then we realized that there's an essential piece of information in there concerning the Sapir Whorf theory. This is the theory which posits that learning a different language rewires how your brain thinks, which is critical information for understanding what is happening to Louise. So rather than remove this scene, they started experimenting with ways of aggressively trimming it, and in doing so stumbled onto an interesting jump cut. We just bashed together some sections of it. And for example, the first cut was from Ian to Ian, a really ugly jump cut. I mean, something uh, so overtly wrong. His head is down, his head is up, and he's talking. And, and then suddenly that gave us an idea that we could tell the scene a different way. They altered the scene to be about the psychological toll the job is having on Louise by turning it into a dream. The lines involving her being taken off the project were removed, and a new ending was created with a surprising reveal. I'm curious, are you dreaming in their language? Rather than her response being directed at Colonel Weber, I mean, I've had a few dreams, but I don't. They used visual effects to replace him with a heptopod. I don't think that that makes me unfit to do this job. I think this shows the importance of experimentation of not being afraid to shuffle your scenes around just to see what ideas come from the quote-unquote wrong way to do something. All in all, a lot of the script for Arrival was cut, altered, or rearranged to create the final film. And this was done to keep the focus on Louise and her character's journey. This is important because it's largely through her and her struggles that the film explores what it means to be human. One of the things that I love about science fiction, when it's done well, is that it's an introspective genre. As Ted Chang, writer of the short story, says, To me, science fiction is not about special effects or giant battles between the forces of good and evil. Science fiction is about using speculative scenarios 
as a lens to examine the human condition. So how does Arrival accomplish this? How does it become a lens through which to examine the human condition? One way is through the design of its scenario. The very premise of the film involves scientists studying why an alien species is the way it is. And by asking the question, how and why do heptapods think non-linearly, the film is implicitly asking, how and why do humans think linearly? By having the heptapod written language be semi-sciographic, it conveys meaning, it doesn't represent sound. It begs the question, how come our written language does represent sound? When we study an other in an open, objective way, we're simultaneously studying ourselves. Arrival also examines humanity through the motivations of the protagonist and antagonists. Louise's expertise in linguistics has taught her the importance of patience, trust, and communication. And every choice she makes is in pursuit of these values. But every conflict she encounters is a manifestation of impatience. Trying to teach him how to speak and read? That's gotta take longer. Or fear. Look at these people. Most of them don't even have guns. Or silence. Shut us Put down. us on radio silence. Do it. We received a message from the hep... Damn it! We need to be talking to each other. You want to talk to them? Find out what this means. And the justifications made by the antagonists are all referencing human behavior. We have to consider the idea that our visitors are prodding us to fight among ourselves until only one faction prevails. There's no evidence of that. I'm sure there is. Let's grab a history book. They're afraid of the aliens because they know what humanity is capable of. The heptapods make no acts of aggression whatsoever. All the conflict comes from us. Examining how Arrival was adapted from book to screen reveals a lot about the medium of film. It exposes the elements of storytelling we expect when we sit down to watch a movie. And it demonstrates how a story that on the surface is about trying to communicate with an alien species can actually be about how we communicate with each other, as shown by humanity's various reactions to their arrival. Hey guys, Michael here. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know a lot of you have been asking for Arrival and it was one of my favorite films of last year, so I was more than happy to do this one. This video has been brought to you by Squarespace. Now, I've been using Squarespace to manage the Lessons from the Screenplay website for several months now, and I really like it. I used to dread updating the website, so I just kind of wouldn't do it, but with Squarespace, it's just simple and straightforward, and I don't have to worry about any of the annoying things that I used to. So I created a new blog post that is a answer to a frequently asked question I get, which is what equipment and what software do you use to make your videos? So head over to the website, check that out, and if you find yourself thinking, hey, I would like a professional looking hassle-free website, then you should get Squarespace. And you should do so by going to squarespace.com LFTS to get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you to Squarespace for supporting this channel. Please subscribe if you want more lessons from the screenplay. Thank you to my patrons without whom this channel would not be possible. And thank you for watching.